Greetings to you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In this episode, we are going to look at the topic, the Hebrew Republic, the Islamic authoritarianism and the Gentile Kings. The immediate context for this topic is the Taliban's takeover over Afghanistan. We know that many of the cities in Afghanistan were taken over by Taliban without a single bullet being fired. Why so? Why didn't the Afghanis, the ordinary Afghanis and the military that was trained by the America didn't fight against the Taliban? There could be many reasons. One reason could have been that there was an understanding between the officials of Afghanistan and the Taliban. And yet another reason would have been that the ordinary Afghanis who were 99 percentage being Muslims knew that the Taliban was trying to form an Islamic form of government. We know how the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan and the retired military officials celebrated the Taliban's takeover. In their eyes, it was an Islamic form of government that was taking over. Why would you fight against the Allah's military men and incur curse upon yourselves? You would rather give up your cities without giving a strong fight. So the question is, why are some societies inclined towards authoritarianism and why some other societies would fight for their freedom? Our atheist friends would want us to believe that wherever religion is dominant, that will go into authoritarianism. And wherever atheism comes into play, they will come to freedom. However, that is not true. We will look how the Bible created the modern republic. But there is an equally important question. How do we as Christians interpret these events? Now, if you speak to the most pious Christians right now, they will all interpret the current events in the light of the secular ideologies. The terminologies would be the secular terminologies, fascism, Nazism, any of those ideologies they would borrow to interpret these events. But how do we as Christians interpret these events in the light of the Holy Piper? So that also needs to be addressed. So in this episode, we will primarily look at three subtopics. One, how Bible created the modern republic. We will look at some of the passages and how People like John Milton interpreted those to support a republican form of government. We will also then look at how the same passages were distorted in Quran to support an authoritarian form of government. And we will look in the current context of India what the Gentile kingship means to us. That is what the Hindutva wants it in India. But at the outset, let me remind you, the Holy Bible speaks mostly in narrative form. It is a Greek way of speaking in conceptual form. As Remy Brake, the historian, French historian of philosophy, he says we should not expect find anything resembling a philosophical concept of freedom in the writings of the Old Testament. First, because there are no concepts in the Hebrew Bible. Deep thinking is present in plenty, but ideas are in the guise of narratives. So if you are going to search Bible for the word democracy, republic, those words would not be there, but the ideas are presented in the form of narratives. We have to read those narratives and then translate it to the Greek form of principles or concepts. Now, this is not only true of the, uh, the uh, political or religious concepts, it is even true of the laws that are given in the Holy Bible. Professor Bernardus Jackson, who is a professor of law, he says the ancient Near Eastern laws, including the Hebrew Bible, gives everything as cases, again not as principles or concepts. We have to take those cases and derive principles out of it. 
So there is a biblical way of writing which is totally different from the Greek way of writing which we are familiar to. Our systematic theology is an attempt to translate the Hebrew way of thinking into the Greek way of thinking because systematic theology will give you concepts. So similarly in this case also of the political ideology we will have to take the biblical narratives and derive concepts from there. Now this attempt has been always been done. In the first century the ancient Jewish historian we know as Joseph was when he was writing an apologetics book against the Hellenized Egyptian Apion who spoke against the Holy Bible. Josephus while refuting him speaks about the form of government and Josephus says some have given all authority to the monarch or the king. Some have given authority to few men oleography. Some have given such supreme authority to the masses but in the Hebrew Bible the supreme authority is not given to the whole people or to a group of people or to one man it is given only to God and then he says if a forced expression be permitted maybe a termed a theocracy placing all sovereignty and authority in the hands of God it was Josephus who first coined the word theocracy to express the biblical idea to the Greeks then but we must understand it was to express the idea to the Greeks then why am I saying this because it is not in the way that we understand theocracy because all the governments of those times in the ancient times were religious in nature so in our understanding all the form of governments at that time should have been called as theocracies but Josephus is saying no 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 it is not like that only the Bible has the theocratic form of government and it is again not God directly coming and ruling over the earth then what did Josephus mean by this theocracy Josephus did not mean a religious form of government because all forms of governments including the Roman Greek ancient uh, Indian Chinese all of them were religious societies and religious form of government Josephus is trying to distinguish it Josephus says the authority over men that did not belong even to the kings but that belonged only to God now as a result if the supreme authority belongs only to God and not to any man or men or group of people then all the human beings are equal in the society so that is what Josephus wanted to express by the term theocracy now in the modern era the modern thinkers understood it and they coined the word as Hebrew Republic because that is what the Republic form of government is all the citizens are equal there is neither a group which is above them nor any man or woman who is above them all human beings all the citizens in a nation are treated and are considered equal professor Fania in her paper the Jewish roots of the Western freedom says this when the modern Republican writers came these thinkers all repeat with individual variations the same basic theme the people of Israel had a republic a nearly perfect republic from the time of Exodus until at least the coronation of Saul despite the transcendent origin this republic was the product of a historical political society so the modern thinkers like John Milton use the term Hebrew Republic rather than theocracy because theocracy would have a different meaning from what it was initially used by Josephus then Josephus idea was only God is other, have the authority and rest of the human beings are equal not in the way of the religious society Professor Fania says when at times these authors follow Josephus in using the term theocracy to describe early Israel 
the term signifies for them a legal and political system listen to this involving citizen participation and civic freedom uniquely blessed in having been founded by the divine imperative in accordance with the natural law even when the modern thinkers use the term theocracy they understood it in exactly the same way as Josephus would have understood it that all the citizens participate and there is civic freedom in the society before I start citing the modern thinkers for the benefit of all let me tell this there are plenty of Hebrew intellectuals in the last 25 years who have been writing about the biblical form of government much more than Christian writers you can see many of their names in the screen for example Eric Nelson professor of government at the hardware new university and in this episode I take a lot of materials from his book uh, on the Hebrew Republic similarly Fania as I already quoted and many other Hebrew thinkers in secular universities and universities in uh, Jerusalem specifically Israel specifically who have been thinking about how to interpret the biblical narrative into modern thoughts and we should be using their materials extensively so let us look at the the modern Republican form of government professor Steve Varys of Fransco Pacific University in his paper the Hebrew Republic says English Republican thought developed in three stages so there were three stages for the development of the modern Republic idea as we understand first in during the 1650s and the writers were people like prominently people like John Milton second from 1670s and 80s and you will have many of the writers there one of them will be Algernon and Sydney whom I will be quoting today and in the third stage you will have people like John Locke and from the all these writings later the American thinkers like Thomas Jefferson Thomas Paine and all were influenced by it hence we will begin with the first stage with the writings of people like John Milton now many of the passages in the Holy Bible were discussed during the early modern eight times but two key passages were specifically discussed again and again when it comes to the idea of Republic the other passages were discussed in terms of the federal structure and other uh, forms of uh, government but when it came to the Republic two important passages were extensively discussed one is 1st Samuel chapter 8 and second is Deuteronomy chapter 17 so we will look at these passages in 1st Samuel chapter 8 as we know from the Bible the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to prophet Samuel and said look you are old and your sons do not walk in the way of your ways now make us a king to judge us like all the nations so Samuel was displeased by it but the Lord said heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them now this is an explosive passage the Lord God is saying when the people ask for a king like the kings of the Gentiles in asking that monarchical form of government the people have not rejected Samuel although they it includes Samuel as well but they have finally rejected God himself so asking for a monarchy is equivalent to rejecting the God or is equivalent to idol worship now this is the only passage in the entire ancient corpus or in any religious scripture in the world where you can see such an explicit condemnation of monarchy in all the other scriptures or on all the other ancient passages you will hear condemnation of specific kings but not the concept of kingship itself but here we have a, such an explicit passage 
which says asking for a kings like the kings of the Gentiles is equal to rejecting the kingship of God or rejecting God himself. And then the Lord God through prophet Samuel continues to show to the people what and how the behavior of that kings would be. When you read 1 Samuel chapter 8 and when you continue to read the verses from 11 onwards, you will see that the kings are taking away the rights of the people. They take away the property. There is no property right. The king can take away whichever property he wants. The king can make them his servants. And it explicitly says that you will be his servants. Read verse 17. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 17. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. So the servitude comes into place. And in 1 Samuel chapter 12 we read this wickedness of asking the king was such a great wickedness and how the Lord God considered it as an abomination and it displeased him. So what is wrong in it? The wrong in it is God has not given such dominion to any man to exercise over another man. Such dominion, such authority over the human being's life belongs only to God. And if somebody tries to take up such authority and exercise such authority over the other human being's life, then is, that is intruding into the domain of God. And when the Israelite asked for such authority to be placed over them, that became equivalent to rejecting the God himself. We will look how the modern interpreters understood this. However, before that, I must add that not everybody in the Christendom accepted this interpretation at that time. There was one more passage as I said, Deuteronomy chapter 17. When in Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 14 onwards and when you read it, it says in 17, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. So the Lord God is saying when you are coming into the land and you will say like this. And the expression as Eric Nelson in his book, the Hebrew Republic says, at the issue is the phrase and shall say. Although the syntax of the Hebrew sentence makes clear that this is purely descriptive, not that you should say like that, but you will say like this. Several rabbis have pointed out that the same form of the verb could express the imperative as well. So the sentence is given as descriptive, but Several rabbis uh, pointed out that descriptive sentences sometimes can be prescriptive in nature as well. So how do we interpret it? So some of the scholars like the Babylonian Talmud said while the Lord God is saying it in a descriptive form, it actually has a prescriptive effect. In other words, they should be asking for a king. This interpretation as we know is totally different from the the interpretation that God rejects the kingship in its entirety, not just some form of kingship, but the human kingship in any form. So if it is prescriptive, and as Babylonian Talmud writers understood that it is in prescriptive, they said the sin is like asking for a king like all the Gentile kings. So if this interpretation is right, even then, God placed certain conditions as we know it in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verse 20 says that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren. So even though he is a king, he should not think that he is above the other human beings or his brethren. So he is considered again equal. So this is God in his gracious way giving a limit to the authority of the kings in Israel. However, not every Jewish rabbi or every Jewish scholar accepted this interpretation. Midrash, which is basically a commentary on the Hebrew Bible, says in De about Deuteronomy 17 that this descriptive form is more or less like a prophecy. That you will say means not that you should say, but you will end up sinning like this. 
and when they are end up sinning like that even then god in his grace and mercy put a limit to the king's authority and did not give them a king like the kings of the nations who had absolute power over the other human beings life so midrash goes on to interpret and say asking for a king is an idol worship they quoted many passages from the holy bible so for example uh, the scripture says in psalms 146:3 do not place trust in important people or jeremiah 17:7 7 says blessed is the man who trusts in the lord and whose hope is in the lord and anybody who trusts in a human being cursed is he and he, they go on to say that it is in vain that you trust a man his breath goes forth he returns to its earth says psalms 146:4 and he they quoted all these passages and then said hence asking for a king is equivalent to idol worship they went on to examine all the kings of the israel uh, both in judah and israel later times as well and pointed out that even the best of the kings actually brought curse upon the people for example because of david thousands and thousands of people died in israel so that was the calamity that was brought by the kings of the jews hence asking for a king is equivalent to idol worship and rejecting god and bringing calamity upon yourself however as i said even those who did not accept this interpretation even those who consider that asking king is okay as long as it is not asking kings like the kings of the gentiles even they placed historically certain restrictions on the kingship in the christianity at that time for example sir henry de bacton who lived in the 13th century he said the kings are under the law that as visar of god the king ought to be under the law is clearly shown by the example of jesus christ for although they are lay open to god for the salvation of human race many ways and means he used not the force of his power but the counsel of his justice thus he was willing to be under the law that might redeem those who are under the law so if the son of god himself was under the law when he came to the world then no human being is exempted from being under the law that is given in the holy bible we can again see this uh, with the king james 1 when the king james 1 he said he is not uh, subject to any law he himself is the law sir edward cook refuted him and said that king shall not be under man but under god and the law so the king is again subjected to the law and god and there are restrictions in his authority even at that time that is the reason we read stephen langton who was one of the chief uh, persons in writing the magna carta he said when a king is the people should resist as far as they can if they do not they sin so the king's authority is not absolute when the king goes wrong then you have to resist him if you do not resist him in the way that you can then you are sinning so even those who accepted the idea of kingship they also because of the biblical influence put restrictions on the king's authority but as i said people like john milton completely rejected this idea and understood the idea as the midrash understood it now john milton's case is an interesting case because he initially began with the uh, interpretation that monarchy is okay as long as there are limits placed on it but he moved to radically the other position within a so short span of time in 1649 when he wrote the book the tenure of the kings and the magistrates he accepted the monarchy but said monarchy has certain restrictions just like the deuteronomy 17 god in his grace gave that the king should not exalt himself over the brethren and they are subject to the law that was more or less the position of john milton but in two years when he wrote again the book uh, a defense of the people of england by john milton in answer to salmier's defense of the king he came to the the understanding of the mitrash and said the kingship itself is a sin in the eyes of the god 
in chapter 2 of the same book he says god frequently protests that he was extremely displeased with them for asking a king they have not rejected thee but they have rejected me that i should not reign over them now this is the explicit understanding of the midrash the commentary of the jews on the holy bible not the babylonian talmud and here john milton is taking that stand and saying that god is extremely displeased with the very idea of the monarchy monarchy himself should be thrown away and the republic is the only form of government that is acceptable in the sight of god and he continues to quote first uh, samuel chapter 10 verse 19 and you have this rejected your god who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulation and in chapter 12 verse 12 he says nay but a king shall reign over us when your lord goes God was your king and he goes on to quote the chapter 17 see that your wickedness is great and that you have done in the sight of Lord in asking you a king so he is quoting all the verses from the first Samuel and see saying see how great was the wickedness in asking for a king and John Milton continues to quote the other prophetic books the book of Hosea where it speaks that uh, in chapter 13 that God in his anger gave them a king in his wrath gave them a king it was not pleasing to God to give them a king so this formed the first stage of the republican thought the English republican thought in the second stage as we know Algar and Sidney he again quotes the same passage and I quote from the Hebrew Republic by Eric Nelson of Harvard University. In it, Algar and Sidney's quotation is given, where Algar and Sidney says, The Israelites sinned in desiring a king. Let us be deterred by it. God foretold the misery that would follow if they persisted in their wickedness and guilt and brought upon themselves the desert punishment thereof. Let their guilt and punishment deter us. Let us take warning that they would not. And if we have no communication with Satan, let us have none of those thrones which uphold that which he endures to set up against God. So any throne of the king, Algar and Sidney understood that is a rebellion against the throne of God. Only God has such dominion over the human beings. No human beings have such authority and power over the other's life. Now Algar and Sidney also wrote uh, court maxims an imaginary discussion between one who supports the kingship and one who supports the republican form of government in this discussion between these two imaginary people the one who supports the kingship says that see how god allowed the kings in first samuel and uh, the one who supports the republican form of government asks this person have you really read the bible and studied it and the one who supports the kingship says, no, no, we have not studied it. We don't study those things. If at all we study, we study Macquillie's book and all, but not the Bible in detail. And then the one who supports the Republican form of government says, that is the problem. You guys do not study the Holy Bible properly. If somebody interprets some, in some way, you take it without checking whether the Bible really says so. And then he goes on to show how the Bible supports the Republican form, and form of government. Now, Algar and Sydney, as we know, was in the second stage of the uh, development of the Republican thought in the uh, Europe. Now, not only Algar and Sydney, in the third stage, when we come to John Locke, if you read John Locke, who again wrote an apologetics book, The Reasonables of, uh, of Christianity, he has extensively quoted from the Bible to support the Republic form of government. Professor Fania, Summarizing all these thinkers says, most of these authors painstakingly showed that the Bible favored the early republic over the subsequent kingdom and argued that it was the very existence of an Israeli monarchy as such or at least its division into two rival kingdoms which brought decline, destruction, exile upon the chosen people. Or in other words, the modern republic thinkers were greatly challenged and influenced by the Holy Bible when they saw the kingship was displeasing in the sight of God and how that kingship brought decline and destruction upon Israelite. And then they warned the people, let us not do the repeat the sin again. Now when the historians write about the uh, development of republic in the Europe, they usually ignore the theological influence behind it. Now that is strange because 
in no other writing you can find an argument which speaks for the exclusivity of the republican form of government even aristotle would say this is one of the form of government which is good but he doesn't argue it for explicitly as i said the only scripture in the world which explicitly condemns monarchy and supports theocracy in the way that the people participate in the society and the political form of government and have civic freedom is only given in the holy bible eric nelson again points out this he says it is strange because there is a puzzle because where did the modern thinkers get this idea they did not get it from the pagan writings they did not get it from the greek thought and the roman thought which never explicitly condemned the monarchy but they got it from the holy bible and how can the historians miss the the holy bible's important part in the development of the republican thought of government in the modern era it must be noted here that in the modern era not only believers like john milton or john locke or alger and sydney even people who rejected bible otherwise who for believed in some form of deism were influenced by the holy bible for example thomas paine he wrote a book called common sense and in the book common sense he again quotes the passage from the first samuel and he says see how the israelites rejected ended up rejecting god by asking for a king and we should not do that because it is an assault on the authority of god even those who did not believe in the bible they also were influenced by it and by that time they understood it as common sense it is common sense that is what they have asked and thomas paine titled this book as common sense here we see while god allows his people to be under any kind of form of government the form of government that god wants it in the world is where all human beings are treated equally only the lordship only the lord has the lordship and no other human being now at this point some of the christians might ask what about romans 13 where we are asked to subject to those in authority in romans chapter 13 verse 44 for he is the minister of god to thee for good if thou do that which is evil be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain for he is the minister of god to a revenger to execute to wrath upon him that doeth evil how do we interpret it the best interpretation is the verse that is given by the our lord jesus christ in mark chapter 12 verse 17 our lord jesus christ said jesus answering said unto them render to caesar that that things are caesar's and to god the things that are god's so we have to render to caesar what are caesar's but we cannot render to caesar what are god's such authority and dominion over the human being's life belongs only to god and we cannot render it to caesar we can render to caesar the tax and all and if you continue to read the romans chapter 13 verse 6 and 7 we read the same thing for because of this you also pay taxes for they are god's ministers attending to you continually to the very these things render therefore to all the due render therefore to all the due taxes to whom taxes are due customs to whom customs are due fear to whom fear honor to whom honor we honor them we pay tax we pay the customs but we will not give them that authority and dominion over lives that only belongs to god we must remember the first century christians in the first two three centuries one of the reasons for the martyrdom was that they rejected explicitly the lordship of caesar when polycarp was taken to be killed they asked him but what harm is to say lord caesar and to offer sacrifice and so forth and be saved so he did not agree with any of this part he did not agree to say lord caesar now the word lord can be used in different senses but here the lord means the lord in having lordship over the life of human beings and that polycarp said i am not going to do what you counsel me and he was martyred for our lord so in the first three centuries while the christians paid the taxes and while they were subject to authorities they refused to call caesar as the lord and they refused to give what belongs to god to any human being now when we come to quran 
we see the exact opposite of this. Again in Surah chapter 2 verse 246, the same passage what was given in 1 Samuel is repeated but with a twist. Here it says in Quran chapter 2, Have you not considered the assembly of the children of Israel after the time of Moses when they said to the prophet of this, Send us a king and we will fight in the way of Allah. He said, Would you perhaps refrain from fighting if battle is prescribed for you? Here the Quran says, When the children of Israel went and asked for a king, Allah was pleased to give them a king, but only one condition, they should fight for Allah. They should wait jihad for Allah. So as long as they were ready to wait jihad for Allah, Allah was pleased to give them a kingship. So this entirely rejected the concept of republic. And the idea of Muhammad propagating this was for his own kingship and later for the caliphate and other lordship over the Islamic nations as we see it in Taliban. Now you might say, no, no, that is actually going too much into that. That is may not be the interpretation. But you look at the context when it is given. The context for this passage as per Imam Maududi is when Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina and when they formed a community and they needed a king over them. So Muhammad said this passage and said, see the Israelites were given a king and the God was pleased to give them a king as long as they were ready to fight for jihad. Therefore, hence I am your king. That is what the Muhammad is intending at it. That is the context of this passage. So Muhammad twisted the Holy Scripture to his own advantage. In this way, we see that Muhammad was assaulting the authority of the one true God that is Yahweh. And throughout the Islamic scriptures, we can see that Muhammad is equating himself to Allah, though he denies to uh, say so but we can see explicit uh, equation with Allah over all the passages in both in the uh, hadith as well as in the Quran for example in Sahih al-Bukhari volume 4 book 53 hadith number 392 where it says you should know that the earth belongs to Allah and is apostle the entire earth belongs to Allah and is apostle the ownership of the earth itself Muhammad take a partnership in that and again, in Surah chapter 3 verse 132, where it says, Obey Allah and the Messenger. So in obedience, not only in the ownership of the earth, in obedience, Muhammad is equal to Allah. Again, in partnership in issuing decrees, in Quran chapter 9 verse 29, Whoever do, who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his Messenger had made him unlawful. unlawful. So the authority belongs equally. And in the judgment, in Quran chapter 24 verse 51, it says, were Allah and the messenger to judge. So they judge together. So how he arrogated himself to the level of God. Now, again, we see that in bhakti, in the devotion, in Sahih al-Bukhari volume 9 book 85 hadith number 74, the home, one to whom Allah and his apostles become dearer than anything else. So the complete devotion, that complete love, that also should belong to Allah and his apostle. Now you might say, Allah is an imaginary figure, therefore why should we bother? We do not bother about whether Muhammad equated himself with Allah. Then we know that Muhammad, uh, that Allah was an imaginary figure. The, but the point is, in trying to equate, he was trying to exercise such authority over the human being's life. And we see the testimony of it in the great poet Abu Hafak, who was muttered by the thugs of Islam. In al waqadi Kidab al magasi page 87, Abu Hafak says, whatever Muhammad says is forbidden, is forbidden for these people. Whatever he says is permitted, if it is permitted, it is more than the kingship. If it was kingship that you believed in, you would have followed Tuba. So our problem is not that Muhammad equated himself to the imaginary character called Allah. Our problem is that in equating that, he wanted to have dominion and authority over the human being's life as God himself. Such an assault to the holy throne of Yahweh. And not only that, not only the prophethood of Muhammad, but Muhammad continued to keep the Islamic community in slavery. In Quran chapter 4 verse 59 we read, O you who obey, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority among you. And how, how much we should obey? 
the sahih hadith goes on to say sahih muslim the book of government book 20 hadith number 4554 when it says if a other those in authority goes completely wrong the one person asks muhammad what should i do and muhammad replied you will listen to the amir and carry out his orders even if your back is flogged and wealth is your stance you should listen and obey even if taliban comes and takes away your property and they flog you you are supposed to obey them and not speak anything against them those in authority you have to surrender and obey as slaves do you are all slaves that is what muhammad is speaking about it now if that is the case what uh, uh, prophet elijah did was wrong right in first kings chapter 21 verse 9 elijah came to ahab who took away the land of naboth and he said have you not murdered a man and seized this land and he goes on to say in the place where go the dogs licked up the blood of naboth there also the dogs will lick up your blood yes you was this is speaking to a king as per muhammad if he flogs you unjustly and takes away your wealth also you must continue to obey him such servitude such slavishness muhammad gave it to the islamic community and that is what we are seeing it in across the world so the main problem with both the Muhammad's prophethood or later the Islamic Caliphate or even the Islamic authority is that it intrudes into the authority of God and it assaults the holy throne of God and it tries to exert such dominion and authority over the human beings which God has not given to any human being. Now we know that this is an uh, expression of the Gentile kingdoms and in fact it is worse than the Gentile kings that the Bible spoke but what the bible spoke as the gentile kings which itself is an assault on the holy throne of god is what the hindutva wants it in india if you read the golwakar's book the bunch of thoughts he wants a unitary form of government not the federal structure again if you look back at the holy bible the 12 tribes were a federal structure the 12 tribes did not have a central authority all the 12 tribes were equal, they were different, but they were united together. So that is the federal structure. So uh, Goldwalker wants to replace it with a unitary state. And he says, goes on to say, if you want a summary, a gist of what the RSS want, you will have it in the bunch of thoughts, part three. The eternal basis, realizing the vision in practice, where he says, what RSS is right now, that is what they want India to be. RSS is form of a miniature. RSS is form of a model that you want to implement it in India. And RSS we know is controlled by one man at the other top who cannot be questioned. What he says you must do. So that is what the RSS wants it in India. RSS does not want this multi-party system. RSS does not want this federal structure. It wants a unitary form of government with a one strong person controlling the lives of the people and that is again an assault on the authority of god which we cannot agree with we will render to caesar what are caesar's but we will not render to caesar what is the god's own authority in matthew chapter 20 verse 25 to 28 our lord jesus christ said but jesus called them aside and said you know that the rulers of the gentiles lord it over them and superiors exercise authority over them this is what the gentiles do this is what at the time of Samuel the people came and asked for. They wanted rulers like the Gentiles, loading it over them, exercising such authority that only belongs to God. But Christ said, it shall not be this way among you. Instead, whoever wants to become a great among you must be your servant. Because Christ himself is the model. Now we have seen that this authority and dominion belongs only to God. And when the Israelites asked for a king, they were asserting the throne of God. God in his mercy again put limits to the Israelite king. But the Gentile kings that the RSS propagates or Muhammad propagated, which is worse than the Gentile king, is an assault to the holy throne of God. Now if the authority and the dominion that is exercised by the Gentile kings are an assault to the holy throne of God, and if Muhammad's prophethood and the Islamic kingship, Islamic authority is an assault to the holy throne of God, you will see even worse in the end times. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4. 
he will oppose and exalt himself above every so called god or object of worship so he will seat himself in the temple of god proclaiming himself to be god so that would be the final assault on the authority of god and we are seeing the spirit of antichrist in the hindutva ideology and the islamic ideology as we see it right now but for us we know that we will render to caesar what are caesar's but we will not render to caesar what are the lords poet john milton in paradise lost book 12 he gives an imaginary conversation between uh, archangel michael and adam now while this is an imaginary conversation the conversation is rooted in the scripture where michael comes and says to adam his descendants that is a human race will later arrogate themselves will arrogate dominion undeserved over his brethren and quite dispose conquered and the law of nature from the earth or the kingship will come and they will try to exercise dominion and authority over the human beings life so adam hearing this was shocked and replied to michael he says authority absurd from god not given such kind of authority is not given what god gave to us adam says he gave us only over beast fish fowl dominion absolute that right we hold by his donation but man over man he made not lot such title to himself reserving human left from human free this is what john milton says and this is rooted in the scripture this is though this is an imaginary conversation the idea is rooted in the scripture it says god did not give us dominion and authority over the other human beings god gave us the dominion and authority over by donation over the other creatures but not over the human beings human beings from human beings are free and that is what is called as a republic i leave this discussion this episode here and maybe think over it ponder over the bible and understand that what is currently happening is an assault against the authority of god and we have to completely reject it we will give to caesar what is caesar's but we will never give to caesar what belongs to the lord and dominion and authority such authority over the human lives that only belongs to god and to him alone belongs the authority dominion and power and may his name be glorified forever and ever amen